Just over a week from today, the first pitch of a brand new Major League Baseball season will fly. And the batter will be the first of thousands of batters to, uh, to try the almost impossible task of hitting a round ball, traveling at speeds up to 100 miles per hour, and darting about as it does so with a round bat. What Ted Williams famously called the most difficult thing to do in sport, and even though we call success in this area, three out of ten hits, it's remarkable that people can do it at all. It's well beyond the bounds of human perceptual cognitive decision-making and even simple human reaction time. So that's what we want to look at. Uh, you may not be interested in baseball. It's hard to believe, but, you know, may not be. However, the thing is that this, this makes a very measurable and kind of extreme, but also extremely measurable sandbox for studying high-speed, high-risk decision-making. And these lessons learned can apply in very many other domains, such as a neurologist, a neurosurgeon, uh, spotting a, uh, a sudden bleeding event during a, an open skull craniotomy, or a security officer spotting a suspicious pair of loafers. Eh, those look okay. Or an armored vehicle operator spotting an improvised explosive device on the side of the road that looked like a bag of garbage. So these are, these are important lessons to be, to be learned in some important domains of, of performance that we all, all rely on. We want to step back and look at something really important. Uh, the shoot-don't-shoot shoot decision-making decision that seems to be in the news far more often than any of us want it to be. A police officer needs to make a decision in the blink of an eye where if he's too late, or she, he's dead. If he's too early, he may shoot an, an, an innocent. So how do we find out what is, what's the way that the people who, who have the expertise in here, what is, what's their secret for how they can make these kind of decisions under that kind of time pressure? And even more importantly, how can we accelerate the development of that kind of expertise? We all have a big stake in that. So let's step back and look at something really important. Guitar Hero, right? Got any, any gamers? <laughs> any people recognize Guitar Hero? Sure, you've got the uh, little um, plastic Gibson C30, and uh, you score points by coming in with your power chord right in the right timing with the, with the bass and drums, the downbeat. But now the poll question. Can playing Guitar Hero help you learn to play guitar? So uh, you all got your, your audience response system, your clickers on the way in? <laughs> we're, using, we're using the analog response system. So show of hands for anybody who thinks, yes, playing Guitar Hero can help you learn to play guitar. For no, keep them down. A couple here, a couple, couple there. Looks like maybe about 15% yes. And 90% of those are smart students who recognize a trick question when they see those. Because nobody really thinks that playing this little Plastic guitar is going to help you learn to play guitar. But in fact, a recent study shows that when we compare musicians, actual professional musicians, with gamers, that is, people who'd been playing a schedule of Guitar Hero, the actual musicians in blue did score better on tuning instruments, something you do, than the gamers in red. But if we look at those parts of the perception of music score that actually are, are, are perceptions, melody, recognizing different kinds of melody, tempo, and rhythm, the gamers actually scored higher than the professional musicians. So kind of depending on how we define that, we want to accept and, and let this carry forward as, as, as we go to talking about our true area of, of pitch recognition um, uh, today. Uh, in, the, in the area of baseball. Keep that in mind. So this is a breakdown. It looks complicated. It is. This is the sequence that has to happen in less than half a second, 400 milliseconds, all the way through there from the ball out of a pitcher's hand to that, that batter swinging and hopefully making contact with the ball. And of those 400 milliseconds, uh, my entire research uh, um, 
uh, emphasis on this for 15 years has been on only the first third of it, 175 milliseconds. And that, folks, is literally the blink of an eye. Not even, not like, like a slow lingering one. I mean, boom, fast blink, just like that. That's the decision framework that we're talking about. Now, how can people be gaining anything of use from that type of framework? Well, one of the things another recent study found is that, is that hitters, experienced ones, can, can actually make a read from before that ball comes out, it, actually picking up the exertion on the batter's face. That's more likely to be a, a fastball coming out with that kind of exertion. You know, we've got the, uh, the arm angle. You know, the arm slot, that's, that's a fastball look. Now, if that same pitcher were throwing a curveball, we might see a skinny wrist. No, you can't see the fingers on the ball, but you can pick that up. Even from 60 feet away with this hand coming through at 90 miles an hour, you can pick up the skinny wrist of a pitcher coming over the, over the breaking ball. So you get little hints and clues as that ball coming out. I like this one. Where's this guy looking? You know, he's throwing a ball at you at 90 miles an hour. You'd hope that he's at least looking at you or the catcher. He's looking... He's looking at a window, a one-foot square window in space, 10 feet out in front of him, that he wants to throw his fastball through, and then also, which is going to come out about waist high, and then throw his split finger fastball through so that it comes out looking the same and ends up down below your knees, make you look like a sucker. That's it. You're standing in there ready to, ready to hit, and you've picked up those cues in that time frame in order to start your swing, and actually be able to hit a ball in the time frames that we're, we're talking about. So how can, you, how can you train that up? We either say it's just talent, and that's what we've said for years, but if we don't, if we don't completely accept that, it's just a, a God-given talent, how do we, we train that up? Well, you know, it is, a, it is a perceptual skill, so we can treat it as a, as a visual skill, and, you know, which way is the C or the U pointed? This is a classic aerobics type of uh, exercise. We can add eye tracking to the eye exercises. Um, we've got little apps now that, uh, that you can get on the computer that show a spinning ball. That's just a fastball spin. It'll, it'll show you the famous uh, dot in the slider. You know, recognize spin. And you can see balls chasing each other around. This would be on the, on the Nike sensory station that they had out a couple of years ago. Now, it looks like something that you would hold in your hand, but this is actually life-size. You stand in front of that screen, touching the screen while you follow those balls around like that. Nike also had strobe goggles that they came out with, and, you know, they go back and forth like that. If you do that in front of your eyes while you're trying to do anything, while you're trying to drive, you know, uh, when you stop doing that, you'll all of a sudden, like, see, like, it's easier to see, easier to drive. It makes some sense. The scientists use these occlusion goggles, in which case you're standing up there ready to hit a 90-mile-per-hour fastball, and right as the ball comes out of the hand, boom, they just shut your eyes off completely. Now, that, that's got to be a comfortable space. <laughs> there was a fellow researcher um, back in 1984 who actually patented a system for triggering off of the pitcher a uh, helmet visor that would, bam, shut off that space. And all of that seems kind of... Uh, exotic, and um, it even gets more exotic now. Now we've got researchers um, who are measuring, putting an EEG cap on ball players, showing them a simulation, there you see it, of a ball, and being able to measure that exact point in time, that exact point in time, uh, which you can see in, in, the, in the colors there, of when they recognize a pitch. The top one is a decision to go, to swing. The bottom one is a decision to know, not swing, understanding that not swinging is, is not a decision not to, I mean, it's a decision not to, to swing. Now, we can imagine uh, something like that being available to uh, managers in the dugout. And in fact, last year, for the first time, they allowed iPad Pros. Before that, was no computers, no electronics, iPad Pros in the dugouts. And it kind of looks like this guy is looking at um, EEG maps, but he's not. Those are heat maps of batter's hot zones. You know, don't pitch this guy high and away, pitch this guy low and in, that, that sort of thing. But they, they kind of look the same. Of course, we've got video games that are getting so much realism that they become like simulations. Really, military-level uh, type simulations. Can't we just train people, give them the whole experience of hitting within that? 
And of course, we've got the sky-high expectations of virtual reality. So in the area of pitch recognition, Jason Giambi, a player who was known to have this skill, is, has, uh, has put out there a, a, a product, and you just slide it. This is one of the cell phone into the front VR, if we've got people who are following VR. Uh, and it, it, can, it can give you a little train up on that. And then we also have the VR cave approach. Now, some folks, we've got the, the, um, the center over here between the union and this building. It used to be the pool room, but you'd have to be a real Purdue old timer to remember that as the room full of pool tables before they put the uh, Envision Center down there. And, and they build within there a VR cave. 3D, big, immersive thing, expensive, and this actually is being brought into the realm now of at least professional baseball. Here's what it looks like, okay? It's simulating, giving you that experience of that pitch, that 90 mile an hour pitch coming right into you, and you try and swing a bat and, and hit it. This, however, is the approach that I use. Yes. This was developed in the early 80s, in primarily in Australia, studying return of serve, another ballistic skill in tennis. And we're, we're cutting off video, showing video. Listen now. See, he just got the first split finger. A curve, split. Fastball, good. Split, good. All right, so you actually see the moment of, of recognition there. I, I kind of described earlier the split finger fastball that'll fit right down there. Fastball. First time he saw it, he was fooled, and then he adjusted, and he started seeing it right away. I can't see it. What he is seeing, I as the researcher sitting there, you can see my hand on the right, I couldn't see what he was seeing. He's seeing, this, this, these videos are being cut off right as it's coming out of there, and he can tell you 90% of the time what that pitch is. I don't exactly know how he does it. And you know what? If you ask him, he doesn't either. So what? You know, some, uh, the, the, in, in this way, uh, the, the approach that I would take here is still much more behavioral. There's a black box. Something magic happens in the black box. I don't need to know what it is. What I need to know is what are the conditions of learning that make it happen. So we see a pitch, you guess the type of pitch, in this case, uh, guess fastball, strike. Well, it was wrong, it was a change-up ball. Okay, let's get, a, let's get a replay, so we put that in mind. Okay, you see that? Woo, that's a nice little change-up ball. So repetition, feedback, and progressive difficulty, which you might recognize as drill and practice methodology. The, the, the bottom feeder of instructional technologies. This is how your kid learns math facts, how you learn vocabulary. But this is stimulus response training. And we don't want people thinking in the batter's box. We don't want paralysis by analysis. We want stimulus response. We want to take the conscious part of your brain out of that. Uh, so that you, you've got a, a situation where you can practice that, either in a, a larger scale, this is a college player here, uh, practicing with a, with a big screen, or some younger players, they're actually pre-high school, working, working just on a computer. So, will watching video pitches help you learn to hit a baseball? Well, it helped you learn how to play guitar, didn't it? So, you know, there are some important implications for this. If you can accept the premise of separating perception and action in these highly integrated perception, action, skills, separating those so that you can train them up individually, it really opens up the, uh, the possibilities for training in areas, again, even more important than baseball if there's such a thing. So, think about that. Put this one premise in mind. This is the one takeaway that I want you to leave with. More realistic does not necessarily equal more learning. We're entering into a realm now with virtual reality where we can put those experiences in. But what this is about, when we look at the expertise in these performance domains that we've described, it comes down to one thing. As Herb Simon said, expertise is nothing more and nothing less than pattern recognition. Pattern recognition. That's what we're building up towards. So that's my, uh, that's my pitch for the day. Uh, I'll leave tomorrow for my spring training research trip. That's what I call it for my, with my uh, wife, you know. So, oh, research, okay, we get tough duty, but somebody's got to do it. <laughs> and I hope that you, somewhere between now and late November, when they get to the World Series, somewhere, even if you're not even the remotest of a baseball fan, that you sit down and take a few moments on television, or maybe if you see a ball game being played at a park, to, to appreciate this and the many types of superhuman 
perceptual uh, cognitive performances that, that we do routinely. Thank you very much.